This is Kelly Michalko, and I'm speaking today with Mr. Len Cruttenden at his home in North Battleford. And today is July 2nd, 1985. And Mr. Cruttenden, maybe you can tell me what circumstances brought you to North Battleford? Okay, um, I, th I think I can trace coming to North Battleford through the um, Spanish Civil War, believe it or not. Because I've been born in uh, London on the River Thames, so uh, I'm a Cockney. And I was born um, uh, during the First World War. So by the time 1936 and 37 came along, I was a young man, 18 or 19, and in, uh, lived in London. And those were stirring days politically, you know. We had the um, Italian fascists and the uh, German Nazis and the uh, Spanish communists and the uh, Russian communists and the, all of Europe was a was a hotbed of politics. And uh, being young and enthusiastic in those days, I tried to get into the Spanish Civil War. I think I was uh, 18 years old then. And in fact, I actually got on a boat and uh, while I was waiting to leave, then the police came along with my parents and they dragged me off the, the boat. And um, that, was, that was the closest I got to the Spanish Civil War. But like I said, feelings were pretty high in those days politically. Well, of course, we were getting pretty close to a war with Germany, so in 1937 I joined the Royal Air Force. It means I was a regular airman. I, I wasn't a conscript. I wasn't uh, called to the colors in wartime or anything like that. I served uh, uh, two and a half years before the war started. Do you recall the outfit you were with? Uh, well, the Royal Air Force, yes. I was, uh, well, in fact, my, my first posting was to the Royal Air Force record office, which is just outside London. But then after a year, I was posted to an armored car company in Iraq, and uh, there, through a series of misadventures, I came home via Palestine and uh, served a while in Palestine and then back to England. Uh, first of September 1939, I got back to England just when uh, general mobilization was declared and we were at war with Germany on September 3rd, 1939. And uh, I remember that day quite vividly. But then, of course, uh, war was very quiet for a while and then we had Dunkirk and the invasion of uh, France and the Low Countries. And um, let me see, I was with a bomber squadron for a year, and then I served with a fighter squadron for a year. And then I was posted overseas. Uh, and uh, I got on a ship with a bunch of other people, and of course I thought I was going to uh, North Africa or to Malta or some such place. My God, we, we'd only been at, well, we hadn't even been at sea an hour before we we found out we were going to Canada. And actually the ship I was on was a prison ship. They were full of um, prisoners, of German prisoners of war, Navy people and, uh, and uh, Luftwaffe and U-boat uh, prisoners. And this at that time was a great disappointment to me. Because, like I say, I was a regular soldier, and, and to be posted to Canada was just like being posted out of the war. And my whole family were in the war, my two older brothers who'd been, who'd been in the first war, and four other brothers, so there were seven of us in uniform. And for me, <laughs> to be posted to Canada was a sort of a, well, it was, uh, let me say, it wasn't looked upon too kindly. Did you know your final destination at that point? No, 
just that we were posted to a, a service flying training school in Canada. And of course, I'd been on operational units up to then, so to go to a training unit was another thing again, but however. So we get to, uh, we, we cross the Atlantic um, without any convoy, just the prison ship. And I remember, I remember the name of the ship even, it was the Morton Bay. And to historians, it was a sister ship to the Jarvis Bay, which was an armed merchantman that fought, fought off uh, quite a large U-boat attack and became quite famous, even though it was sunk. However, um, yes, we get to Halifax and to a place called Moncton. <laughs> and I remember that quite well because uh, the first thing we did was go into one of these dockside cafes and we had steak and eggs and that's the first time we had steak and eggs for a long, long time. And then, of course, even though I was aware of the, uh, you know, of the size of Canada, it really doesn't strike you because until you get on a train and have to go someplace. So there was uh, three of us, I think, that was posted to North Battleford. And we got on the train at Moncton, and five days afterwards we arrived in North Battleford. And what year was that? That was uh, January of 1942. And so what was your first impression of North Battleford after being a native of London and having uh, traveled through well, most of the world? Well, that's why I'd, I'd seen a little bit of the world before I came to North Battleford, and... Uh, but really, we, like we came in the in the middle of winter. But in those early days, I can well, you know, we were issued with um, um, uh, parkas and heavy winter underwear and uh, and overshoes and a and a fur cap, if I remember rightly. And uh, we just couldn't wear the things, you know. We uh, the cold didn't really didn't really bother us you know but of course now I'm a little older I do feel the cold but then in those early days I didn't but anyway uh, uh, the fact the fact that lights were on and that you could go into a that you could go into a cafe and order a steak for 75 cents and that included uh, everything apple pie and ice cream and everything else uh, well, we were sort of um, wonderstruck for a while, you know. But you get used to every, you get used to anything. And I, I remember I was a sergeant at the time, and I was working at the headquarters building in the administration. And uh, it was just like peacetime. We'd work, work from eight o'clock in the morning till five o'clock in the afternoon, uh, and then, then you were free. And weekends were free. It was unbelievable in a world of, in a world at war. So there's no real feeling of excitement that uh, the world was at war. No, the only thing that uh, the only the only thing is that we had lectures every day. Not a lecture, but uh, time every day to to take stock of the war. We had um, all kinds of reports coming in, and we had the news on the radio and. Uh, at the uh, ground instruction school, we used to have to give uh, uh, lectures on current affairs to the to the uh, pilots under training, you know, just to keep them up to date. And we used to trace the front lines across uh, Russia and North Africa and that kind. Of. So we kept in touch with the war. We also kept in touch with the civilians. It didn't take any time at all. I think I told you about the uh, entertainment am amenities that were in town, but I'll let you... Uh, well, maybe you can uh, tell me um, what was the population of the base and um, what exactly was its role? Oh, gee, the population now. Well, I, I, I would... Uh, memory's a bad thing when you're going back 40-odd years, over 40 years now. But it seems to me there was about 1,500 men on the base. And maybe 500 of those would be 
pilots under training. Uh, you have to remember the, that these fellows knew how to fly an airplane. They'd, they'd been taught how to fly. But at this particular school, they were coming from a sing single engine light plane to a two engine uh, training plane. And here they were taught not only their flying skills, but navigation and uh, that kind of thing. When they graduated, after about a year, then they would have their wings, and from this school, they would go to an operational training unit where they were, uh, where they learned to fly the uh, Lancasters and the Blenheims and the um, and the Hurricanes and that kind of thing. Uh, one thing they did here when they when when a person graduated and got his wings, he was assessed as to what kind of a pilot he was going to be, and he. he he would be posted to a bomber command or to fighter command for fighters or to coastal command for uh, flying boats and that kind of thing. Um, I've been told that um, there was a lot of bomb practice, that type of thing, a lot of flying activity around the city. Do you recall much of that? I don't think there was any bombing practice. I, I would doubt it. Um, that that may have come that may have come when the Royal Canadian Air Force took over the base from the Royal Air Force, and uh, that may have been after my time. But no, no, they weren't they weren't taught bombing tactics. That would come at uh, at the operational training unit for, operational training unit further on. What they were taught was navigation, and and flying. Oh, so I know I. I think probably what people are being confused about is that we had an emergency landing field at um, uh, five or six miles down the road here. Hamlin. Hamlin. And uh, there they used to do forced landing exercises. And along the river, uh, they would do low flying exercises. But that's all. We, we've had, uh, we had several uh, trainees disciplined for low flying in the district. They were probably showing off to their girlfriends uh, and not being too bright uh, because that sort of thing is frowned upon when there's a civilian population around. You just can't do those things, you know. But uh, boys will be boys. So the RAF training center here opened in June of 1941 and it closed in, right. in December of 1943. Right, right. And you were working there since 1942. Since, yeah, since January of 42 until uh, December 43, that's right, yeah. And then it became the Royal Canadian Air Force. Then the Royal Canadian Air Force took it over, and the, but it was the same kind of school. Where we trained, all British boys, and uh, the RCAF, uh, I have learned since, trained not only their, not only Canadians, but they trained uh, Free French, um, Dutch, uh, Czechs, a whole, you know, a whole bunch of people, a conglomerate that took their flying training here. Yeah. Yeah. And did you stay on in North Battleford after 43? Oh, no. No. I was posted uh, home, and uh, in six months I was in uh, India and Burma. I yeah. see. Well, maybe we can talk a bit about maybe the impact of the RAF in the time that it was in North Battleford and some of the activities you got involved in, might we say, extracurricular? <laughs> yeah. Well, okay. Um, uh, first of all, I think I'd better say that there were a lot of uh, lot of people with British extraction that were already here, and uh, the good thing that uh, those people came forward and welcomed us with open arms. You know, they were, I guess, to the 
to those people that were already here, we were just like uh, a visit home. And in those days, of course, people really thought of Great Britain as being home. In the 40-odd years since, that has all changed. We're all Canadians now, and uh, Britain is not uh, uh, so close as it used to be. But in those days, uh, the king and Great Britain and the empire were, uh, well, it was quite a thing. And if we, did, we never felt like strangers. We, we were in a British country. In, the, in those days, everybody was British. It was only after the war, I think it was 1st of January 1947, that they brought in a bill uh, in Ottawa, in the Parliament in Ottawa, making people Canadian citizens. Up to then, they were British citizens. So anyway, that's the atmosphere that we came into this town. And there was a whole lot of families, uh, farm families and people who lived in the city that welcomed us into their homes and entertained us. And also their daughters. There, there was a whole lot of entertainment going on with the, with the girls around town, and most of it was good. Uh, in fact, a lot of our fellows married and settled down, witnessed me, and I could name a dozen others. And also, of course, a lot of girls married um, uh, fellows from the Air, from the Royal Air Force, and now are now living in England and uh, all over the place. Uh, from time to time, we have uh, people come back to visit who uh, their wives, former North Battleford girls, haven't seen home for 40 years. So, you know, that's, that's quite a thing, too. Now, that's as, that's as far as the light entertainment was concerned. Uh, oh, there was dance halls. One famous one was um, Uncle Tom's Cabin. Where was that Old located? Mr. Coven. Uh, that was located where the, um, hmm. see, it was along Railway Avenue. It's, um, I believe there's a service station there now. Well, it wasn't too, well, it was right on the corner of what was then 110th Street. And, uh, of course, 110th Street, the original 110th Street has been uh, eliminated. Mm -hmm. But it was right in the uh, uh, original corner of 110th and Railway Avenue. And that was a good place, you know. It was well, well run. And uh, only rarely did it ever get rowdy. And they'd have to call in the MPs. But generally, it was a civilian that started the trouble. I can say that after after 45 years. But generally, it was a civilian that, that caused trouble. Uh I remember another dance hall, <laughs> and uh, I guess it's all right to say this, but that was called the Bucket of Blood. And it seems to me that that was over the um, the building now that's the uh, RM of North Battleford. It seems to me it was in there, but I'm a little hazy. I'm a little hazy about that one because although I remember going to it once. And that was a that was a pretty dreadful place. But uh, who ran that place? Oh, gee, don't ask me. But it was uh, I can remember there was a fellow on the drums and uh, somebody with a with a banjo and maybe somebody with a piano. And I it wasn't the Ritz. I can tell you that. But it was all. But it was all right. They, I don't think they had any trouble there. It was just some kind of crazy characters that would get in that place. But uh, then outside of that, of course, there was the churches, and uh, our boys were very active in the church. I can remember uh, the organist at Third Avenue United Church was an RAF uh, sergeant. And at St. Paul's Church, of course, uh, most of us were um, Church of England. We used that church, and I, c I can remember the padre. In fact, it uh, seems to me he gave me a Bible at one time. Was it the Reverend Jordan? Yes, it may have been the Reverend Jordan. Um, anyway, um, as a result, the um, St. Paul's Church 
when we left here in 19, at the end of 43, um, we put in a really nice stained glass window in St. Paul's. It uh, consists of uh, mostly RAF wings and the RAF crest. And uh, it reminds everybody that the Royal Air Force was here between 1941 and 1943. And also, um, the RAF had their own newspaper. Yes, uh, we, uh, we published a paper. I wish I could find a copy. And it was called The Plainsman. And it dealt with the news, uh, news of the district and uh, news of the war. It came out once a month. And uh, it was a sort of a historical record, too. And uh, personally, I was quite active in that. And I really don't know why I don't have any copies, except 45 years ago is a long time, and I've got them around somewhere. Uh, when you phoned me to say that you were coming, I tried to find these things, but where they where they are, the Lord only knows. Because, mind you, we've, we've been in this house for uh, thirty odd years, and uh, it's around somewhere, but I just can't find it. Any um, notable people that you can remember, friends of yours that worked on the paper that maybe still around North Battleford, or that were with the RAF at that time with you, and oh. are still around North Battleford? Gee, you know I can't. Uh, when I was trying to find these things, I came across a whole lot of letters that I'd saved from from some of my friends, and uh, the names came to me, but, gee, I just couldn't attach faces to them anymore. Maybe just a few names that uh, you can remember then? Uh, well, I, I could... Uh, let me see, there was a, a Flight Sergeant Kissack who uh, married uh, one of Mayor Dean's daughters, I can remember him. I was associated with him. But, um, I remember. I remember him because because of the mayor's daughter. We thought that's a that's a pretty fine thing for a fellow to come out and marry the mayor's daughter. You know, you could almost write a short story on that. But uh, it's probably a good job he didn't marry her. Well, maybe we can move on and yeah. uh, talk about the time you spent uh, out of North Battleford after 1943 and reaccount how you ended up back in North Battleford. Oh, well, of course, yes. Well, in 1943, or oh, maybe, maybe the beginning of 1943, I was invited out to the Saskatchewan Hospital by a family for Christmas dinner. And uh, that's where I met my wife. Now, my wife was, um, her maiden name was McNinch, Dorothy McNinch. And uh, she worked at the hospital at that time. And her family, her father had worked at the hospital before her. And uh, her, her sister and her brother-in-law worked at the hospital, but they lived on the hospital grounds, you see, so that's where I was invited. And... Um, so uh, that's how I met my wife, and we were married in July of 1943, which makes me being married 42 years this year. And uh, uh, my wife is really, uh, she came to Canada from the north of Ireland. Um, her father was widowed in, in a little town outside of Belfast, a place called Whitehead. And uh, he came to this country in, uh, oh gee, now it must have been about 1912, I really don't know, but anyway, it was before the First War. And uh, then uh, left his two daughters and a son in Northern Ireland and came out here after his wife died. And he worked at the hospital, and then of course there was no no traveling during the first war so I, when uh, the um, first war ended then his family were able to join him at, at the hospital 
Now, when I when I met uh, when I met Dot, her father had been dead a couple of years, and there was only a sister. So anyway, within six months, we were married, and uh, that's it. Well, then at the end of '43, I had to go back home, posted home, which was which was fine. It's not that I wanted to get away from my wife, but I wanted certainly wanted to get back to the war. I mean, my whole family was in the war. I, uh, at this time, of course, my mother had spent uh, every night for three years going down the air raid shelter every night. You know, across of the raids, you see, in London. So I was anxious to, I was anxious to get back into the war. Well, I got back to England. My wife stayed here, of course. I wasn't going, I wasn't about to take her into the war. And uh, got back to England, and like I say, within. Six months I was posted to India and Burma in a different atmosphere altogether. You know, we were we, we were fighting against the Japanese then, and which was a totally different picture to North Battleford in wartime. We were really in the war. Or oh, I can remember travelling by train for five days in India and then uh, getting on a ferry and going down the. Uh, Brahmaputra River to a place called uh, Akiab, uh, which had just been vacated by the Japanese, and we took that over. And uh, the war, the war, we were winning the war then in Burma. We'd been losing it for some time, but we were winning the war then. And uh, I can remember. In uh, forty-five, we were we were just about to invade um, Malaysia, a place called Kuala Kuala Lumpur. When uh, the Americans dropped the first atomic bomb on Hiroshima, and uh, another one a, a week later. And uh, the Japanese war was over. So we were issued with uh, brand new uh, uniforms, and we were going on uh, occupational troops to Japan, occupational forces to Japan, which I was very well looking forward to, because at the end of the war, when the Japanese surrendered, we were in a place called Rangoon. Which has a which had a famous jail called the Changi Jail, full of prisoners of war. And uh, we flew down there on uh, I can't can't say it was a rescue mission because the war was over, but we were, we were going to contact the prisoners. And you have never seen anything like the state of those uh, poor fellows. Well, you, you've seen newsreels, I think, of uh, Canadians coming back from Hong Kong. Um, anyway, they were pretty skinny and pretty ill and pretty sick, but we got them out. And uh, to this day, I'm not too happy with, with Japanese. I've forgiven the Germans, but I, uh, I haven't yet forgiven the Japanese. But that's, that's a personal story. Anyway, um, when the when the war ended, I say we were supposed to go to Japan, but at the last minute, the airport, the air, the aerodrome that we were assigned to couldn't accommodate bombers. I was on bombers then, bomber squadron. So they sent a fighter squadron instead, and we were disbanded. And I came back to England. I was posted to headquarters fighter command, which as a warrant officer. And I was quite happy about that because uh, one of my boyhood heroes was uh, Horatio Nelson, Admiral Horatio Nelson. And Headquarters Fighter Command was a house that he built for Lady Hamilton. And uh, so um, shortly after that, I got out of the Air Force and um, the Air Force paid my ticket back to North Battleford, where I rejoined my wife, and I went to work at the Saskatchewan Hospital, thankfully. I worked there for uh, 
almost 32 years. What year did you return well. to North Battleford? Uh, oh, I got, got back to North Battleford uh, on the 1st of January, 1947. I can remember the first time I came to Canada, I, l I left England from Southampton on the 23rd of December, 1941. And um, when I returned, I left Southampton on 23rd of December, 1946. And, uh, oh, I say I got to North Battleford on 1st of January. That isn't right. We docked, we docked into uh, Halifax on 1st of January, 1947. And um, it took me five days to get to North Battleford. So when you arrived in North Battleford, um, you started working at the Saskatchewan Hospital. How did you manage to get a job working there? Well, that's quite a story again. You know, I was, uh, I can remember quite well, I'll never forget it. That's why I have so much sympathy with people who are out of work. Um, I, I, I got back here early in January, and I was out of work until the 3rd of March when I went to work at the hospital. And they weren't very happy days for me. I, I would, I, I'm very, very thankful that I never had to go through that uh, twice. I got a, I got a regular job and stayed with it. Because I, gee, uh, the value, the value of being at work far exceeds the amount of money a f fellow ever earns, you know. Uh, I can't imagine anything more terrible than being out of work, especially a, a family man. However, that's by the way. Uh, I wasn't the only one. There was a lot of fellows came back, and they were in the same boat. And I can remember a, uh, at one time, there was, um, or oh, there must have been uh, 10 or 15, no, maybe not 15, I'll say 10, people that found jobs at the, at the Saskatchewan Hospital. And of course, in those days, you, uh, you went to work on the wards, you know, dealing directly with patients, which was a completely foreign to me. However, I stayed with it, and uh, with, with a fair degree of success, but uh, as other jobs came up in the hospital, I, I applied for them and got them, and uh, within two or three years, I was, I, oh, uh, there I go exaggerating again. Within five years, anyway, I was the uh, paymaster, which was fine, which was, which was my line of work, and I was happy with it. Mind you, I worked hard, but uh, then that, I really didn't work hard. I enjoyed my work, but, but uh, you had to stay with it because, I mean, it's a responsible job. Now, other fellows came back, uh, stayed, st some of them stayed in nursing, some of them um, uh, took up trades, some went to the uh, powerhouse, became engineers, which is okay. Uh, several fellows work for the railroad, and I believe there's one or two that still do. Uh, most of us have retired now. So there's quite an influx of men after the war. Oh yes. That returned. Oh yeah. Oh, I, I can remember um, a couple of fellows. A couple of fellows uh, found jobs with um, with the RM. One finished up as the. Uh, or he was the secretary of the of the RM for years and years, and there's another another fellow down the line here that's been secretary of the school un unit for years and years and years. In, in other words, we're well integrated into the community now. We're all Canadians, although you're not going to be able to tell that by my accent, of course. Yeah. Um, while you worked at the hospital, um, 
Would uh, Dr. McNeil have been the head of the hospital at that time? No. Uh, Dr. McNeil had, um, he died, gee, no, I think, I think Dr. McNeil died in 1946, or pretty close to it. And, uh, oh, gee, no, he was the superintendent. Isn't that terrible, my memory? If somebody was to tell me his name, I would know it. But anyway, it was uh, it was an assistant of Dr. Mill, Dr. M McNeil that was the um, Dr. Nelson. Dr. Nelson was the superintendent. And then after Dr. Nelson, I think it was. Um, hmm. Gee. Some fellow that was imported from uh, from uh, Ontario, anyway, and he was a famous psychiatrist. I should remember his name. And then uh, after that fellow, there was a doctor De May, who died quite recently. And uh, then after doctor De May, I think they ceased to. Uh, oh, there was there was another doctor. There was a Greek doctor that was a superintendent for a while. And then when uh, when he left, then uh, the powers that be decided that you didn't need to be a medical doctor to be a uh, superintendent of a mental hospital, which by now has become the, um, they now call them executive directors. And uh, the, uh, the next executive director was a uh, psychologist, uh, Dr. John Gray. And then when he left, then they, they just had an administrator promoted to executive director. So the medical part, the psychiatrist part, ceased to function as the supreme uh, administrator in the hospital. It became, uh, over the years, I often think that's, that's maybe hasn't worked out so good, but then who am I? I'm, it's not, that's my opinion. That's I, I think still think a medical doctor should be in charge of a hospital. It's just like putting a civilian in charge of an army camp. I mean, it just doesn't go. And um, while you were employed there in those days, back in the 40s and 50s, I guess, they would have had their farming and their gardens oh, yes. and all that type of thing. Oh, yes. Um, well, there was a pretty famous uh, chicken and pig farm across the river, which, which is now which is now the um, uh, special care home, Battleford Special Care Home. And uh, when I first went to work at the hospital, they had uh, pedigree pigs over there. And uh, by the by the hundred, and chickens. Uh, and uh, turkeys, and uh, pheasants, pheasants by the thousand, I would think. Wild pheasants, you know, that came in to feed. And uh, on this side, they had a dairy herd, um, and Dr. McNeil started that herd in the uh, early 20s. And uh, they were purebred, oh boy, what was the name of the black and white milk Holstein. cows? Holstein. Holstein. Holstein, that's right. And we had a farmer, I mean, uh, his, his classification was a farmer, and he looked after that. We had an orchard, and uh, gee, now I wonder if I can get the year right. I guess in the early 60s or late 50s, the government decided it was too expensive an operation. Oh, now wait a minute, I think I can pinpoint that. It was when uh, uh, Mr. Thatcher formed the Liberal government that they decided to close down the farm. And that beautiful herd was sold off piecemeal. Uh, 
Well, I suppose it did some good because uh, I imagine there was a lot of farmers that took one or two of those cattle and used them for further breeding, I guess. But it was a shame to bust up that herd. And the irrigation farm uh, became uh, just... Uh, it just wasn't economical according to the according to the thoughts of the day and so the pigs and the chickens were disposed of and the orchard was torn down believe it or not it's unbelievable but they actually did that so that we didn't grow our own potatoes and we didn't provide our own chickens and pork and uh, milk these had to be bought from outside and consequently our uh, whole raft of patients were thrown <laughs> out of work. So what's your opinion in general of that disbandment of the farm? And well, in, in, in terms of politics, I suppose uh, I suppose they could justify it, but uh, in terms of um, patient happiness, uh, patient comfort, I don't know. Uh, you know, uh, the people from around here are all farmers at heart. Eh? And uh, if a fella gets into trouble, you know, mentally, and, is, and in those days, of course, the, you were put into the hospital. You were um, committed to a mental institution. Uh, we thought it was kind of nice that they had those familiar surroundings, you know, the cattle barn and uh, working on the potatoes and working with the pigs and the chickens. And Oh, gee, some of those patients were absolutely key personnel. The, the people that were nominally in charge, the paid employees, uh, depended a great deal on the patients that looked after their, the cattle and the pigs and the chickens, and they were all experts. And they had, um, oh, I could tell you a thousand stories about uh, the things that some patients did, like they would take a team of horses, hitch it to the wagon and take it over to the fair and try and sell it and that kind of thing, you know. And uh, But uh, every, everybody knew these patients and uh, knew them by their first names and they, they knew everybody and it was... Uh, more or less a family life uh, for both staff and patients. But uh, what has happened since, of course, is that uh, progress in treatment has reduced the number of people even able to work. I mean, the people that are left in the Saskatchewan Hospital now, generally speaking, are, um, are uh, unemployable. You know, the others are out on the street. Um, so, Mr. Crettenden, in your opinion, what do you think the impact of the Sask Hospital has been on North Battleford and perhaps Saskatchewan in general? Well, of course, um, I, I, this will be a lot of hearsay outside of personal experience. I mean, I, was, I wasn't here when the hospital opened up in 1913 or 19, uh, 1919. It was built in 1913. I think it opened up in 1919. And a lot of local people found employment there, which wasn't there before. And of course, they were employing people all through the, the uh, Depression. I just don't know how many people they employed in when I was when I didn't work there, but I know there was a lot of patients, and uh, I guess a lot of the people were from town that worked there. When I came, uh, there were about 700 employees, and there were there would be a salary of around three and a half million dollars coming into town. So, I mean, it was really uh, of great importance to the town's economy, or to the city's economy. Uh, I can also remember they weren't only local people. There was 
people that came down from Prince Albert from uh, or from Indian Head, I can remember. All kinds of people came to work at the, at the Saskatchewan Hospital. And uh, in those days, of course, there were only two facilities in uh, the province. There was one at Weyburn, a very similar, uh, very similar operation, and uh, Saskatchewan Hospital here in North Battleford. Since then, they opened up um, uh, training schools for, re for uh, retarded people. And I suppose in my day, uh, there would be 3,000 people employed in, in, that, in psychiatric services. Uh, Moose Jaw, Weyburn and North Battleford. Since then, of course, uh, with the advance of uh, uh, psychiatric treatment, the number of patients has been reduced uh, drastically, and therefore the staff has been reduced drastically. The Weyburn Hospital is closed, and that must have had a terrible impact on the town of Weyburn, or the city of Weyburn. The present Saskatchewan Hospital is not quite closed. I think they have couple of hundred patients and probably 300 staff. But that 300 staff, with inflation, their salaries uh, run uh, four and a half, five million dollars. So you see, the city hasn't lost that much. The big psychiatric centers have been reduced drastically, like I say, but they've still opened up a uh, psychiatric unit attached to every general hospital and there's staff there but not as many as we had in, in, in former days. There are more patients, outpatients now. In my day there was no such thing as outpatients. But today they have uh, traveling clinics. They travel all over. And uh, I don't think there's the same impact in the city that there used to be. I mean, 700, 700 people is a lot of people. 300 people is not as much, but uh, so there's, there's not that impact. I don't know where it's going to end with, uh, with um, putting a correctional unit out on the hospital grounds and now... Uh, uh, um, a school for, um, what do we call it, um, uh, kids who get into trouble, young persons. I think they call it the Young Offenders Act, where they, where they have to be confined to part of the hospital. And that, we're going to have a different kind of staff again. So uh, I suppose it all evens up in the long run, you close the mental hospitals and fill the jails. Eh? So you've had quite a long, uh, interesting life, and part of it's been in North Battleford. Oh, yes. I've had a long, interesting life, and it's not over yet, that's what. I'm extremely grateful to the Saskatchewan Hospital. I mean, we have an attachment to the Saskatchewan Hospital. I think I said earlier on that... Uh, when I first went to work there, it was a family business. People worked there whose fathers had worked there before them. And uh, we got to the stage where sons and daughters were working at the hospital. So it was a family affair. When I retired, it wasn't the family affair that it was. Um, uh, politics were, were more... Um, to the forefront than, than I can ever remember. Uh, but since it's the taxpayer's money, I guess that's fair enough, and communications being the way they are, instantaneous. I think probably the politicians have uh, more of a direct, uh, more of a direct touch than they used to have. Well, thank you, Mr. Crattenden.